For that, I'd like to turn it over now to Chip Rogers. I'm very proud that you're a Madison board member. Yeah. 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 I was always honored to be here, Michael. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, um, unlike some who, uh, and I'm not an elected officer anymore, say whatever I want, right? Yes. Right, exactly. 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 I think the problem was is I used to do that even when I was in elected office. Uh, but I, I welcome cameras. Uh, and thank you for videotaping this because I. No, I always, always welcome that. And you should always be wary of those uh, in elected office who don't allow cameras or suggest that they don't want it because uh, if they're not willing to, to say the same thing in front of a camera that they would uh, to somebody else, you probably have a good idea of what kind of <laughs> elected official you have. And I also want to thank uh, Charlie Spurk for being here today, uh, one of my dear friends and a, a true uh, patriot, which uh, after witnessing from the outside looking in this time what happened at the legislature this year, we need a whole lot more of those. Uh, <laughs> didn't realize it was going to fall off that fast. Maybe I would have <laughs> the, uh, I'll, I'll make a bold statement here at the beginning, because one of the statements that, that I read was uh, in concerning your legislators that are involved with ALEC, is that you need to find out who your legislators are that are involved in, in ALEC. And I agree with that, because I will tell you right now, the ones that are involved in ALEC are the only chance we have to turn this thing around. Not, they're not the problem. They are the answer. And I think after I explain this, hopefully I'll, I'll get most of the agreement with it. Charlie's been a proud member of ALEC for many years. Uh, I was a proud member of ALEC when I, when I was part of that. In the legislative world, just so you know, you have obviously 50 states that are all coming up with all sorts of ideas on what kind of laws to pass, right? Um, and we, we, we welcome that. I mean, the whole system was set up because the states are the laboratories of democracy, right? These laws shouldn't be passed to the federal government. In fact, one of the arguments we made, I think all of us, on Obamacare, irrespective of how bad we think the whole thing is, is that even from a process standpoint, it would have always made a lot more sense to say, that's something that should be handled at the state level, and let a few states try it, and then if that's a really good idea, and it catches fire, then the federal government at that point should entertain it, but never should the federal government be the ones who start with this blanket, blanket policy. So I think we all agree that these laws, if they're going to be made, should be happening at the state and local level. So because of that, there are a multitude of, of associations that bring lawmakers together simply for the purpose of sharing ideas. And I'll rattle off a few of them to you. The biggest one is NCSL, National Conference of State Legislators. Okay? In the National Conference of State Legislators, your General Assembly in this state and in most states, and I'm Charlie, you may have to help me with this, I think in the state of Georgia every year we use $50,000 of your taxpayer money, maybe even more, to be a member of NCSL. So NCSL, National Conference of State Legislators, is funded with public taxpayer dollars. You have CSG, Conference of State, I can't remember what the acronym is. Anyway, same thing, state legislators, they're part of CSG. Again, funded by taxpayer money. For a number of years, until a few of us got rid of it, the state also funded a group called National Conference of Insurance Legislators. And what was that? That was, if you're, if you're on the insurance committees in the House and Senate, you can participate in this, and they have meetings all over the place, and they sit around, they share information on what is the best insurance legislation that's happening in all these other states. And I can tell you, that was an interesting uh, organization because I went for a few times, and they always had their meetings in the greatest places, but they were the most boring meetings you can ever imagine sitting around for eight hours in a day talking about nothing but insurance okay all apologies to anybody here who sells insurance but it is not the most exciting topic so you have all these groups that actually provide a pretty good forum and it, the whole goal behind all of them is to share ideas on whatever it is that the lawmakers are doing in the state of that state whatever because frankly we we can't always come up with the best the best ideas all amongst ourselves in the state of Georgia. And it is a really good idea when we have a good idea to go share it with others or if we're looking for a solution to find out what happened in another state and bring it back to Georgia. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I remember when, and many of you recall, we were dealing with uh, the issue of illegal immigration. We had some legislation that was in the state of Georgia that really um, was the first state to take on a lot of this stuff. People from Arizona called and said, hey, 
Can you share that with me? People from Virginia. I remember at least 10 states calling me and saying, well, explain this, explain that, explain this. Well, these forums, whether it be Alec or anything else, are our purpose or our platform for doing that. So the difference between Alec and the rest of these groups is twofold. Number one, Alec does not take any taxpayer money. It's completely privately funded. And number two, that the issues discussed at Alec are all based on free markets. If you read what ALP actually stands for, free markets, federalism, those that, that, that's what all of the ideas that, that people bring to the table are about. Now, do they get it right 100% of the time? Of course not. Nobody's going to get it right 100% of the time. Yeah. But if you've ever gone to an ALP meeting and, and you hear the issues that are being discussed, it is the same type of what I would call conservative, liberty-minded issues that are being discussed right here in this room every time you guys meet. Would that be an accurate statement? It is generally the, the way that I used to look at it and explain to someone from the outside is that Alec are the conservative legislators, NCSL, CSG, the others are usually anywhere from the middle to, middle to the left. That, that's the group they go to. So, um, First of all, I want to say, I want to say a few, few more things about the 11 Alive thing, and then I want to get into um, what it is, what is the concerted effort uh, that has been going on for about the last four years to actually get rid of that. Um, if you were to go to the Georgia General Assembly and say, all right, who is the one lawmaker that we would consider probably the most left of center? Anybody have any? All right. Bingo. <laughs> and if Nan were here, she would probably agree with you. Yes. She takes great pride in it. So who do you think 11 Alive goes to to sit down with and say, what do you think about Alec? The most liberal member of the Georgia General Assembly, okay? Who I believe at one time, and maybe this is going back many years, I believe she actually had on her, on her website a picture of her cutting sugar cane in Cuba when Castro was there. Oh, yes. Okay. Again, now she can refute that, and I could be 100% wrong, but I believe that she's better with All right. The second thing is that uh, in that 11 Alive report is that they said, well, it's just a good old boys club. Now, you can, that's the term that's often used when you don't have anything else to refute what someone may or may not be doing. The president and CEO of ALEC is a female. <laughs> the chairperson last year of ALEC is a female. The chairperson next year of ALEC is a female. <laughs> Charlie's is a female, <laughs> and, and was probably part of Alec for, for many, many years. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's terminology that often people throw out when they don't have anything else to say, and I, I think that's certainly the case there. The second thing, and most, or the last thing I'll say about the, the WXIA program uh, that was so factually incorrect on this, and it is something that has been repeated about Alec, and really repeated about all the other organizations time and time again, is that Laws are being made. Now, guys, I, I can't even believe that the, the reporter had the guts to say something that is so patently false and ridiculous. Alec can't make any law. The only thing Alec does is discuss public issues, ideas that have been talked about in other states, bring them to the table, create what's known as model legislation, and offer it as an example of something that you may or may not want to do in your state if that's what you want to do. It is nothing more than an idea. It is absolutely no different than if any single person in this room went down and talked to their lawmaker and said, you know what, I've got an idea on how to um, fix the traffic problem in Atlanta. And what we're going to do is we're going to restrict anybody under the age of 25 from driving a car, and here's a piece of legislation that would do that. It, it's absolutely no different. All Alec does is say, here are some ideas that work in other states. And by the way, they're all liberty-minded ideas, free market ideas. If you would like to use them, you're going to have to take that, whatever that idea is, you're going to have to take it and apply it to your own state. You're going to have to introduce the bill like you would any other bill. You're going to have to go through the committee process like you would any other committee process. You'd have to do everything exactly the same. And then, of course, the governor of that particular state would have to sign a piece of legislation. So when they make this ridiculous statement that laws are being made, it is that I, I mean, I don't, I, how do you get away with that other than you're 11 alive and no one watches your channels, 
And you know, the media has gone so far off the deep end that they just go accuracy and fairness and, and it just doesn't, truth doesn't matter anymore. So by the way, the same thing, NCSL, CSG, they all do the exact same thing, except for two things. They're funded by the taxpayers, and Alec is not funded by the taxpayers. That's frankly the only difference. And when a few years ago, when all this stuff started coming up about Alec, I made that, I sat down with a number of reporters to ask me about it. I said, I, I understand you're upset about this for whatever reason, but when every one of these other organizations is doing the exact same thing, but using taxpayer money to do it, why is that not the problem? Because that should be the problem. Now, who are the groups that are attacking Alec? Well, has anybody here, here heard of Democracy Alliance? Democracy Alliance is led by Mr. Soros. They're funded to the tune of $480 million. And if you look at their recent, most recent publication, Alec was mentioned more than any other organization as what's wrong with America. Okay? Half the time they said Alec was illegal, the other half the time they said Alec is, is successful, so we need to copy them. Um, the groups in that you may know around here that attack Alec nonstop, of course, is Common Cause. I'm not sure if you're aware, but almost the entire Georgia Common Cause board resigned in the last few weeks because they have now come out and specifically stated that their purpose, Common Cause's purpose, is to destroy conservative groups like Alec. I mean, that's their stated purpose now. Um, and then I guess the, the greatest form of flattery is imitation, right? So because these groups over the last four to five years have been successful in petitioning large corporations to uh, drop Alec, but Alec was strong enough to continue to grow, and in fact has as many legislators now, almost as many legislators now as they've had at, at any time in the history. They're continuing the attacks, but they've also decided to create their own. And they've created this group, uh, group called the State Innovative Exchanges, the Project 6. And it is funded by Soros, and it's funded by all those groups. And that is essentially the far left version of what Alec is on the conservative side. The problem is, is usually with far left, uh, it is that there's no legitimate ideology there. So those things like, remember when we used to have, uh, what was it, uh, left-wing talk radio? It never worked. Because they can't hold up, they can't stand the pressure of examination, right? Because the logic doesn't follow on their philosophy. So I suspect these people will get a ton of money, but I imagine it will go the way of all these other causes, and eventually it will fade away. Because it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to the other person. So, um, so whether it is the purpose of ALEC, which is to be a platform and a sharing of information of free market answers to public policy, um, or whether it is the recent attack on ALEC, I mean, someone has, people have often said you're, you're known by your enemies. Well, if you look at the, the, the enemy list of ALEC, that, that, that tells you a lot, right? Um, or the fact that you look at the legislators, and this is probably the most critical part, the legislators that have been involved in Alex and where they generally fall on the political side of the aisle. And I'm not talking about Democrat or Republican, I'm talking about do they believe in liberty or do they believe in totalitarianism? Where are they on, on that political spectrum? I think you will find that Alec is all, actually one of the very few associations out there and organizations on a, on a nationwide scale that as people who love liberty and expect such out of our lawmakers that we should actually be supporting. So, Michael, I know that was a long-winded answer, hopefully a decent defense of what Alex <coughs> is trying to do, but I would be, because I know the organization inside and out, I'd be glad to answer the question. Wonderful. Chip certainly appreciates your, your explanation. Again, the Madison Forum likes to hear both sides of an issue before we form our own individual opinions. We don't rarely have an issue and opinion as a group. Each person here comes to their own conclusion and we have convergence of opinions. But <clears throat> one of the things I think that is underlying suspicion of ALEC and other organizations is that we have seen legislation come out of the Georgia legislature that has been quite disturbing. People have gone down and listen to and give them testimony to people from this organization against HB 310 and other that seem to be in violation of the Constitution and of the state.
state, supporting the state and gaining power. And there wasn't one citizen down there. There were groups and organizations, but there wasn't one citizen in the two meetings that I attended that supported no not warrants. Okay? Where they can come in and do a flashbang in your house. But nobody said, I like this idea. You can do this to me anytime. It was being promoted. It was being promoted by uh, district attorneys. And then on HB 310, there was lots of testimony. And you go to YouTube and Google it and hear the testimony and the questions. And it still passed. Citizens were ignored. So when we find that organizations come in, such as organizations promoting Article 5 convention by paid people, and the citizens are not heard, and they have other opinions, then at some point we grow very, very wary of organizations with paid people meeting with state legislators behind closed doors when the state legislators do not seem to give proper uh, attention and consideration to we the voters, and we've seen this spiral downward in our nation, uh, in our state, and in our counties. Without naming all the specific counties, everybody knows. So I wanted to preface it and couch our statements and many dialogues uh, with that as a background. It may not be the case with everybody here. And we like to start on different sides of the room. Last time we started on this side. So we're going to start on this side and go down the table and then come back and go down this table. If I could make one statement, I want to touch on uh, what, what you just said on two accounts. First of all, I'll start with no not warrants. Um, for a number of years, three or four years, I uh, sponsored, co sponsored a bill with none other than Vincent Ford on this exact issue, making clear that we should not have no not warrants. It was absolutely totally wrong because there has been some gray areas to whether, and there certainly have been activities by law enforcement that they just simply do it. So we were making it clear we could never get it through. Many times it was just me and Vincent. Uh, and obviously we're on opposite ends of the political spectrum on most issues. But on that issue, we were, we were, we were joined at the hip. I was very sad to see that the legislature went one step further this year in, in, in supporting this, this ridiculous idea that you could just barge into someone's house at, 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 uh, at any time. And it's, uh, I think it is, again, a sign that, uh, that perhaps the, the train's coming off the tracks in a few areas. Uh, a $900 million tax increase this year, which most people don't know anything about, is another sign that, I mean, do we want to fix our traffic? Of yeah. course we do. Of course we do. But the state also, by the way, brought in, uh, we'll finish up the fiscal year at 1.2 billion, 1.3 billion than last year. Well, that would take care of the entire 900 million, right? If you just spent what you spent last year. Right? So I don't want to delve too far into that. But your larger issue is that lawmakers uh, are, as you characterized, meeting behind closed doors with, with interests other than, other than typical citizens or not typical citizens, us, right? And our voices do not seem to be heard. Yeah, exactly. Um, the two things I would say that is that private enterprise, um, small or large, should always have that same voice, right? And the fact that they want to go speak to their lawmakers and are successful in doing so is not an indictment of them. It's an indictment of lawmakers who don't value the citizens on the same level, right? So we should not say to ourselves because uh, an insurance company ABC is able to go sit down and have a meeting uh, through Alec uh, with <clears throat> ten conservative lawmakers to talk about you know ways to do. I'll, I'll give I'll give you a real world example. One of the one of the uh, model legislation that Alec wanted to do, and it's a model you can go look up that we actually passed in Georgia, where I think we're one of the first couple of states that passed it, was allowing people to purchase insurance across state lines, which is great, because that was one of our answers for Obamacare, and that is, is that let the free market work. Don't have a system where you can only buy insurance inside the state of Georgia, open it up to 50 states, and by, by the way, you'll get a lot more products, and the more products and services you have, the price will eventually come down because of the laws of supply and demand. So therefore, one of the things that Alec was pushing for and got as model legislation was to allow 
insurance to be purchased across state lines, which we think is a great free market, free market idea. Well, it shouldn't surprise anyone that insurance companies would go talk to lawmakers and say, hey, this is a good idea. We'd like to sell more product. Right? That's not what made the thing become law. It became law with that in the state of Georgia because it's a good idea. Unfortunately, I think it's just us in Wyoming that do it. So until you have a, until you have a few other states, it's not going to work. But, um, but it's, it's not Alex's fault and it's not the insurance company's fault that they wanted to do that and, and, and try to make that happen. Um, it would be the lawmaker's fault if they're not willing to sit down with citizens, come to events like this, I mean, I don't, I, I, I've been here many times, and I, of course, came here many, many times. I don't think I ever turned you down an invitation no. when I serve. Um, but you should demand that out of all your lawmakers. Uh, I know Brian Kemp comes here occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are other lawmakers who you probably invited who just don't seem to find the time. <laughs> and you, there are probably other lawmakers who you visit their office and they just don't seem to find the time, right? And so, that is the problem that you need to solve through the ballot box with those. With, and why don't we have Madison Forum meetings that, as much as I love the Rip Ranch, but let's have it at a place that holds five times as many people, let's have five times as many people, and begin to affect change in, in that manner. Because you are exactly right about one thing. The disconnect between lawmakers at every level, city, county, state, and the people they govern, that gulf has grown wider and wider and wider. And you would think that social media would have shrunk it. But you know what I'm learning is that, and, and social media is an incredibly important tool, but what I'm learning is, is that there are so many ways that you guys get your news. Let's take a step, let's go back 20 years, and I apologize, but this is really important for what we do here in this, in this room. Let's go back 20 years ago. If the AJC was, was going to write something bad about you 20 years ago, and you were a lawmaker, you were really worried about that. Why? Because you knew a large percentage of your voters got their information through that single source. That's right. Now, what has happened is there are so many sources by which lawmakers, or, or we as citizens get our information about lawmakers, there's so many sources that if one or two of them say something bad about you, you don't worry about it too much because there's 18 or 20 of them, right? Like if a blog says something bad, uh, if Conrad writes something negative about an uh, elected official on a blog, they're like, eh, it's just one blog, who cares? I'll go on to the next. So there's a great benefit to having all these sources of information, and I think that's wonderful, that's the way it ought to be. But it also has allowed the lawmakers, in a certain sense, to almost shield themselves. Uh, they're, they're, when we go through redistricting, just so you know, there are some lawmakers who like to have a bunch of different counties. You know why that is? Because they can always make one county believe that the reason they're not paying attention to them is because they're paying attention to all the other counties. <laughs> and it's kind of that theory, right? It's that, it's that theory in play. Anyway, long answer, I thought. Okay, we'll start over here. Joyce, you've got your hand. Thank you, Chip. Um, my question to you regarding Alec is, an individual as myself, that I want to go to the meetings, the, the cost of the meetings, I know it's a private organization, it's very costly. Is there any way that they could talk with something for citizens that may want to join with a very minimal amount of money? Like, I think the legislators get a cut on they have to pay scholarships or something. Right. I don't I'm know. Just I'd have to ask them. I, 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 but I, I mean, it, it makes sense to me, and I have never found them ever to be uh, an association that tries to shield people from not knowing what is going on. Um, they are, again, ask Charlie. So they've been in open <coughs> any organization or more open than any organization I'm aware. Of. Sheila, I, I just wanted to know how. Um, Involved is the Chamber of Commerce in Alec. I've never like seen. I've never seen the Chamber of Commerce involved at all. Because you know they tend to be <coughs> the ones in the so many other areas of right. our lives now that I don't really trust them. Yeah, I've never seen. Them. Now you're saying they, they are not. In, the, the U.S. Chamber, I, if they're a member, I'm completely unaware of it. I mean, I'm just not going to be a member of it. Right. Rather than the Chamber mm -hmm. itself. Excuse me, Frank. I'm sorry. <coughs> so I don't, I don't know that. All right. Conrad, you had your hand up. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not that familiar with that. So when did it start and who started it? Uh, you, you know? started in the 1970s. Yes. I wasn't going to. <laughs> um, I can't remember who started it. I don't know. 
I mean, one of the things that... It's not a website. I was just curious. One of the things that I think would be helpful is go look, every year they give away the Thomas Jefferson Award mm -hmm. and look and see who it is they've given it to. I mean, President Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, it is a list of who's who among the conservative flock. It's not definitely not. I mean, there's speakers for people like Margaret Thatcher when, when, uh, when she was still alive. Uh, those are the type of people that generally, uh, Congressman Gingrich was a uh, speaker, I should say, had spoken many times. Uh, Chip, it seems that there is a non-transparency element to it. It seems that a large segment of the votes have been co-opted by secretive meetings between state legislators and corporate lawyers, lobbyists who invested interests. And around the Capitol, you know, this is an Alex bill. It gets voted on. Uh, it seems that to be the case. Not always. <laughs> But in the Georgia area, as I read it and talk to people, it seems that a great portion of Alex's business has been co-opted by business interests, and they're using the state legislators as water boys to carry the bills through. Here's your comment. Uh, I would say that happens in every General Assembly across the country all the time. Just about, I mean, you guys are there. You see hundreds of lobbyists out there. So that, oh, that yeah. I mean, that's a larger issue to solve. The Alec, let me just tell you the way the Alec <coughs> process works. So Alec has uh, all these legislators, and they have committees. So there might be a committee on, um, we'll just say taxation, which is headed up by Jonathan Williams, one of the best committees you'll ever see. So on this committee on taxation, in that committee, there will be uh, certain private sector businesses, and there will be uh, public sector. And someone, uh, a public sector member, has to offer up essentially a bill, an idea. And then it goes to multiple hearings, just like it would in, and, and, and timelines. You can't do it all, all at one time. And then if it comes out of that committee, uh, and both sides, the public sector and the private sector people, all vote on it. If it comes out, and I'm going to say taxation, there's probably 150 people on that committee. It's not like six people, it's a ton. Then it goes to the ALEC board. And the ALEC board is 100% lawmakers. There are no private sector people on the ALEC board whatsoever. Then the ALEC board votes whether they want to make that a model piece of legislation. They make that as, as a model piece of legislation. And then they make it available, whether it's on the website or upon request from a legislator. ALEC is barred from and, and has gone to court to show that they don't do this and has been found that they don't do it. They cannot go to a lawmaker and say, this is an out model bill, and I want you to see what you can do to pass it. They absolutely cannot do that. And, they've been, and they were sued, I believe it's in the state of Minnesota, and the judge looked at it, threw it out. So they, there's no evidence to support that they've ever done that. So all they do is say, here's a piece of model legislation. If you as a lawmaker have questions about it, we'll be happy to answer any questions. This may be something you want to introduce in your state, may not. They're, they're not allowed to advocate for it. But then the lawmaker, and I introduced a number of ballot bills, the lawmaker will then take it and go to his or her legislative council and say, okay, here's a model, how does it fit in our state? And then they just introduce it just like any other bill that goes through the entire process just like any other bill. Thank you. Jim? Chip, is someone who used to be somebody, but now I've decided to be nothing. I'm not a Republican anymore, I'm not, I'm not a baby boomer, I'm not a uh, conservative. I'm not, yeah, I just refuse to be a part of those groups. Could you pull back? You get away from all, I would say, the rhetoric and the boxing that goes right. on. The only thing I see keep going on, this is all about influencing. And the influencing is all built on money. Right. And how do you get the money out of it? There's little people go down and, but Joyce or she look down and they argue their point of view, but they don't have any, any, any scraps. To really, the legislators are all being affected by whoever put the most money in their pockets. It's not about the little people, it's now about how much money you can feed. If you go on to any of these campaign disclosure reports, there's very few little people putting money in the campaigns. If this law firm, Frank would say, this construction firm, this engineering firm. So it's all about, as Frank was trying to get to, business interests or special interests, and the little people have been shut out. So I, I don't know, how do you get the sources out? How do you get it? Because sources here, Alex here, and it's like, you feed me, I'll feed you. Here's and we get left out. Here's what I would say to that. First of all, I agree with you 100%. But that's an indictment of everybody in this room, not the business interest. We elect people 
who either are easily influenced by that stuff or then become influenced by that stuff, and we allow them to stay in office. So when you see your lawmakers and you see them behaving that way, it's our responsibility to get rid of them. The converse of that is to say that business interests cannot donate money. And you know, we looked at that in the, the most recent, uh, what's the case, what's the law? Citizens United. Citizens United. And I think the Supreme Court, for the most part, got it right. I mean, either we're a country of free speech or we're not. And as much as we may hate some speech, Everyone has a right to do it. And if people want to collectively bring their money together and say, we're going to put together, like even as, I'm going to set aside George Soros, so I'm talking about US citizens only. But let's just say that uh, the most liberal person in, in the United States, uh, Ariana Huffington, let's say Ariana Huffington wants to take a billion of her dollars and go influence legislation. As much as I hate everything she stands for, as much as I hate her point of view, I don't want to tell her she can't. And when the lawmakers then respond to her, because she lavished them with so much money, I mean, that is a problem that we have to solve with the ballot box. And, it is not an easy answer, and I'm with you, and I wish I had the answer to say. Well, wait a minute. See, but Ariana Huffington or Soros can give their money all day long. <coughs> when we need some people with integrity, say, no, thank you. Yeah. It's asymmetrical. <laughs> asymmetrical. Yeah. Yeah. Bill? Okay. To that question right there, in North Carolina, Alec came in and tried to convert a school district area into a privatization system. And eventually, the people who rebelled went back to a regular school system. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Well, I, about five or ten I'm years. I'm not ago. familiar with it, but I know that they didn't come in and try to because they're bar from doing it. They may offer. Well, someone may use an Alice model bill. Okay, whatever how they did it, they were pushed in and then they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and eventually the people rebelled back. Good. No, we want a regular school system like we, we had before. Well, I, I I hope that happens all over the place. It's the same argument we have on on privatization of schools right now. Yeah. <laughs> Very close to getting on my soapbox here. <laughs> you guys know where I am on this. I, yeah, I do, yeah. Guys, when a school, if, 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 if schools have to respond to market forces and one of them closes, we should celebrate that. You know why? Because we got a whole bunch of schools out here who don't respond to market forces and we can't force to close, right? I want a system where the bad ones go out of business. Whether they're public or private, let's get the bad ones closed and let's celebrate the good ones and learn from what they're doing and open up some more good ones. But that creates cheating because they don't want to lose their school because they don't have the right grades and stuff. And so you got a whole system of people cheating on their tests. But you either believe one of two things. You either believe the government knows best or you believe the people know best. Right. And when it comes to education, one million percent of the time, parents know better than yeah, the government. Absolutely. And so let the market forces work. They've worked it throughout history and everything we touch. Let market forces in education work. How is it that we're 30th in the, in the world when it comes to education, and we idly sit by, by the way, spending the most money, and we idly sit by and accept that as some sort of, it, 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 oh, that's fine, yeah, because you know what, our local high school's got a great football team. So it doesn't matter what the graduation rate is. But I'll, I'll go one step further, and I'll get off my education soapbox. What's the best high school in Cobb County? Walton. Walton High School. Test scores proof, time and time. Do you believe that every student at Walton High School, best high school, but do you believe Walton High School is the perfect fit for every student there? No. Yeah. So, do we want to change Walton High School? No, because they're doing fine for the 90-something percent they're getting right with. But the 10% should be allowed to go to another school. We don't have to get rid of Walton High School, but if that choice doesn't exist, if we tell that 10%, you know what? You live on 123 Elm Street, you're not allowed to go to another school except Walton because we told you that you go to Walton because we're the government, we know best. If your parents, you know there was a, there, there was a, a, a woman that got charged with a felony, a felony in Clayton County because she dared to register her son with her brother who lived in Henry County so he had a chance to go to a decent school. This is what happens when you put government in control of something and give them the entire operation and tell everybody else to forget you. Sorry. <laughs> On the topic? All right, come in over here. Oh, I'll start, please. Yes, well, we're, we're at this table now. Oh, okay. sure anybody wants to ask a question? First, let me preface with a comment, uh, Chip, that your comment about, or your reference to the, I believe it was the Minnesota court decision that right? throwing it out because there wasn't any evidence that Alec was acting improperly. And you and I both understand that no evidence is not synonymous with it didn't happen. 
You've got to have evidence that it did happen. To prosecute, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And it seems to me that the question from down at, uh, on 11 Alive had to, the question seemed to revolve around Georgia's ethics uh, legislation and what lobbyists can and can't do, where and when they can't do. And it was just given the appearance from the 11 Alive report that the Alec personnel who were there were attempting to keep the press out of their business so that it could not be discovered whether or not Alec was, or Alec representatives were acting improperly. But what was really uh, annoying from my perspective was the use of uniform deputy sheriffs in obvious obstruction of the First Amendment of the Constitution concerning the freedom of the press and it being given tacit approval by the ALEC officials who were there. Now, ALEC needs to address some way when it comes to bringing this model <coughs> legislation to the attention of state legislators. It needs to address how it's going to do it in a transparent and accountable way, rather than bringing in these uh, uh, hobnail booted uh, brown shirts that we're coming to despise more and more every day from the abuses, which they are, which are now, thank God, for cell phones because now when a cop messes up and it displays his ignorance, toward the rights, privileges, and immunities of citizens, more and more of it's being caught. Which brings up a, a, a question. I understand that Alec does have a a justice committee of, or a justice sub-organization. So my question would have to do with why don't they address the either address the corruption in the judiciary which I know you're aware of it, or <coughs> address legislation that would add to the power of the grand jury in our state and, and honestly I don't know that that doesn't exist. Remember, there are hundreds of Alec models. <coughs> they may have, and I apologize, I didn't know that question was coming, so I didn't, I didn't have the answer to that. Sorry to blindside. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> if I, I'm just saying if I knew I would have prepared and would be to say, yeah, they have it or no, they don't. So, I mean, I think we're in agreement on that. I know a little bit about the 11 Alive reporter, who uh, many of you probably know of my disdain for the media, because I think, in general, they're very dishonest. Uh, in general, they have the story written before they started, which is not journalism. That's, that's not journalism in the least. Uh, the same uh, corporate interests that influence legislators influence them as well. And, but at least in, in no way are they honest about it. <laughs> I mean, it, I would love for MSNBC to just come out and say, look, yeah, we're far left. We admit it, but they try to portray themselves as being in the middle. This gentleman, uh, who was a reporter for 11 Alive, registered for the odd conference with his wife and children and said he was just there vacationing in Savannah. Uh, he registered with Alex? No, at the hotel. Oh, at the hotel. Where, okay. where wife, he said he was just, not that he was there. He didn't come up and say, not, 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 I'm here from 11 Alive. I'd like to do a report on Alex. Will you grant me access to this meeting? I think if they would do stuff like that, they would probably get a more open audience instead of trying to, to sneak around. The second thing is, is that you still do have a freedom of association that doesn't necessarily mean that the media is allowed into your association. Just like in this particular event right here, if 11 Alive came knocking on the door and Michael, ostensibly the leader of this group, said, not that you would do this, but if you said, look, it's my right not to have you come in and join our meeting, he still has that right. Whether that's the right decision or not, I, I can't speak to that. 
But I will say one, one other thing that, that I, I know frustrates the people about, and it gets back to the entire bias of the whole situation. All these other law, law these other groups that do the exact same thing, NCSL, CSG, which are on the left side of the spectrum, that do the exact same thing. Many of the same government um, affairs people, we'll say, well, I'll just pick one out because I don't want to pick on one individual company, ABC company. The ABC company hires uh, a lobbyist, right, or a government affairs head, whatever they want to call them, right? That person that goes to the Allen meeting is the exact same person that goes to the NCSL meeting and the exact same person that goes to the CSG meeting that does the exact same thing. But the news says, Alec bad, these guys okay. Or we'll just ignore them over here. And I think from an Alec standpoint, they get very frustrated. And I've been in their shoes before. You get frustrated with bias media. And you say to yourself, you know what? If you guys can't even be fair and say that this, it, it, everybody does this exact same thing, then we're, we're just not going to talk to you at all. And maybe that was the response, maybe it wasn't the right response, but I, I didn't make that decision, so I don't know. Jack? Chip, I, I know you're not an agent of ALEC. I know you don't work for ALEC. I know what you're speaking of is past history of, right. of your same thing. I'm sure someone will say I'm getting paid by them, but I'm not. <laughs> hey, we've already seen that by now. You would have got a question, so right. don't worry about that. Um, the thing is, is that we know you said that Alec, everything you do is all free market based and, and federalism, and I'd have to disagree with you because they stopped legislation that would have stopped Common Core. Now we know for fact that the supporters monetary of Alec is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Microsoft. They're the big proponents of Common Core throughout this country. So, and I'm not saying they're all bad. I think the 11 Alive piece did kind of <coughs> shred it up a bit. No, Nanork isn't a good example. But I guess what it gets down to, what I'm asking is, every time that we find something that's wrong, you know, we find a thing that this is wrong, we know it's wrong, we know Alec did this. Right. They didn't handle themselves correctly. We know where they stand, you know, like I say, with Common Core and Microsoft. We are the bad guys. And everybody, Judson Hill has beaten unfriended people because we've questioned him about it. <laughs> I mean, to me, you know, I mean, that just throws more mud in the water because it's, we should be entitled to this. You guys are driving the bus, not you anymore, but when you were there, you were driving the bus and you did a good job at it. You let people come in, but now we've all been shut out. And that's, that's handled with the ballot box. But let me just say about Common Core, uh, because while you're right about where Al was on Common Core, they're actually in a different position now. And the second part of this is I think um, you may ascribe a little bit too much power to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as, as a contributor to the association. Um, their annual, annual um, budget for Alec at that particular time and even today is anywhere from the seven to ten million dollar range. And I believe the Gates Foundation probably donated fifty thousand max. Mm, I think it's more than that. I'm pretty sure. I, I'll find out. I, think it was a million. Million. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely find out. But I can promise you because I was part of Alec back then. You have to remember that the Common Core when it started was a Republican idea pushed by Governor Jeb Bush, and to a certain degree his brother, right? Yeah. And at that time, I, I remember, because I was part of that, mm -hmm. Jeb was extremely <clears throat> active in Alec, because set aside Common Core, some of the things he was doing in education reform, like um, some of the school choice options that he gave, some of the letter grading that he gave in, in, in Florida, were all good things, things that most virtually all conservatives believe in. So he was actively engaged in all things education as it came to Alec because Florida was finally doing some of the things there that we had all thought were a good idea. Um, and I had calls with him. I, I specifically had a call with him and he said, he said, look, I think this still thing can still work. It's a good idea. He may have taken a step back from it. I don't know how much he's taken a step back. He still owns it to a certain degree. But, um, but I think the Republicans in general, um, who again are not all conservatives, have now begun to see some thanks to work from you guys about how bad Common Core actually is, this isn't such a good idea. So when they first put it out, it did become a model, piece of model legislation for Alec. The Republican idea, it seemed like a good idea to have standards. There has been a significant retreat, and in fact, if I recall, and again, I'll look this up, because I don't, I have to go back and ask people about these things. There's actually legislation, model legislation being uh, taken into consideration now at Alec to repeal that. So they don't always get it right. But um, I would argue that more than nine times out of 10, I would argue 19 times out of 20, the model bills that come out are 
in line with the general thinking of this group and, and Liberty Levy people. See, I haven't found much of that though. Looking on their site, I haven't. I'll send you. I, I'll randomly have, choose. I'll randomly choose ten. Please, because I, uh, I really haven't found them. Let me. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you. Uh, 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 this is and, and this is why the left hates them so much. I, and I introduced this bill. You can go look it up. I mean, it's probably ten years ago when I introduced it. There was a model piece of legislation. Do you remember when we were arguing in this state about um, these loans that, that the left don't like people to have access to? Pay them. Pay them. Pay them. There was a, a model piece of legislation Alec, that said any private citizen can loan another private citizen money under any circumstances they want as long as, long as fraud and deception don't occur. And that was the law. If Conrad wants to lend me $100, I'm sure he probably has at some point, and he wants to charge me 25% interest, and we enter into a private contract, it's none of the government's business. Now, usury laws would say that we can't do that because government knows best and we're too dumb to figure it out ourselves, right? But, and that's a perfect example of our model bill. There's, there's tons like that. I'd be happy to, again, Mike, I will send this to you if you'll ship it up. I will. And I'm not going to cherry pick. I'll actually randomly just choose 10, good or bad. Mary Kay? I'm a former school board member. And as God bless a, you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as a former school board member, you all passed Senate Bill 84, which made it so that I couldn't talk with two other school board members. When, was, when was that? What's the say? In 2010, it was the school board gag law. Okay. And so what happens with Alec could not have happened on, on the school boards because we're not allowed to talk to each other unless we're in public, unless it's just one school board member to another. But Even what, if the topic is not about schools? Right. If we have three school board members together, we right. cannot be alone. We have to have the public there because of the If Senate. I took part in that, I apologize. That's kind of a dumb law. Well, yeah. it, it's, well, first of all, I didn't take part in it, but if I voted <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for apologizing yeah. because it made it really <laughs> difficult to be a school board member. Um, I studied all the education legislation that came through, not this year, but last year. And we stopped it from being passed. And so I spent several months going to many communities talking about how we shouldn't pass the legislation. Which one is that? Um, you want me to give you a list? No, 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 no. It just an idea, a general idea. Like okay. what? What do you felt? What do you feel like you helped kill? I didn't. I helped kill it last year, but this year everything that I helped to kill, it all passed and more. And just so that you know, I mean, you say market, but when we passed Senate Bill 410, when you guys passed Senate Bill 410, right. it changed the way schools are rated. Schools are not rated based on academic performance. They're, rate, they're rated based on CCRPI points, and those points are given by the U.S. Department of Education. And therefore, initiatives that are coming from the U.S. Department of Education, such as behavior management, positive behavior intervention systems, AP, IB courses, the Common Core tests are now in every grade level at the end of every course instead of having a high school graduation test, which wasn't aligned to Common Core. In addition, the charter schools now have to have special different requirements where they admit educationally disadvantaged students before they admit other students. So the whole market is a monopoly from the U.S. Department of Education. What they say happens has to happen in these schools for them to get these points. So they'll have a high school rating and be able to stay open. So the whole, the whole thing has been taken over. There is not a free market in education. Oh, no, there's not. Everything that we do as teachers has to line up with Common Core in math and language arts. It's not even reading. Well, anymore. there is a free market in education. You can homeschool your children. Well, I'm talking about what I'm talking about when you're talking about schools closing, because I've been in right. those schools that needed to close. The schools that we're closing are not necessarily the lowest performing schools because right now, according to the charter system and the IE2 system, they can get any school. It could be a high performing school. If it drops below a 60, 
it can be taken over. Right. I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but I'm envisioning something much different. Than okay, all today. this is Alec legislation. What you're envisioning is not the reality of what actually got passed this legislative session. So I, I'm not talking about what got passed this session. Well, legislation. that's what I'm talking about because Alec is behind it. We'll get, get the, show me a bill that said this is the Alec model bill. Okay, House Bill 502. I talked with you about this on the phone last year. Okay. Remember we were talking about the online learning courses? Yes how all of those, the Georgia Connections Academy, they struck out all the language in there that were safeguards for online learning, like pupils uh, to teacher ratios, certification, success, past success, all that is gone. The only thing left is the, con the content standards Common Core. So in order to do online learning, you have to have the copyright for Common Core. If you have the copyright, you can do it. So Georgia Virtual Connections, is, was owned by McGraw-Hill. It was sold to Apollo Learning. Pearson came in and bought it from Apollo Learning. So basically you have Gates and Pearson who control all of virtual learning in our state right now. School board members have to pay for it. They have no authority over it. School board members have no authority whatsoever over testing, over curriculum, over when kids learn something, what they learn, nothing. The only thing school board members can do is raise the taxes to fund the you U.S. Department that. of Education initiatives. All right, Pearson's England. Yes. I got. I got what you're saying. Here. Okay, but that's all. All this. I, I could give you 12 bills. It's all Alec. Well, you got to show me that. I, I, I tend to not believe okay. it's Alec's model. Okay. It is. Can you follow up with them? HB 502, HB 91, Senate Bill 133, Senate, I, I hear Senate you, but that doesn't mean Alec doesn't HB number the bills, so that, those are Georgia bills. Mary, Mary Kate, you're going to have to do that offline. But here, here's what I would just say about that. It is, okay. this, is where, this is where I think you and I are disconnected, okay? You're saying that the charter school system or the regular school system or any school system is being monopolized by these outside entities. Right? It's the fact. Okay, I'm not disagreeing with you. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. But let's take the charter school system away. Let's just get rid of it and say it doesn't exist in Georgia. The existing public school is still being monopolized by the same system. Right? So. Well, it wasn't until we vote, you all voted to establish a non elected, <coughs> appointed char um, charter commission. Also, <coughs> You um, voted now, just this last session, to establish the Opportunity School District, right. which is also I'm not there anymore, so I didn't okay. know. But, but here, but I'm sorry, here. at some point we, we have, your line of questioning was intelligent, informative, and knowledgeable. But let me just answer it, if, if I could, because okay. I think this is what big disconnect is. The, any system that is government-run and government-owned, whether it's encapsulated in one miniature system or subdivided into 10 different systems, right, is, is not what we want, right? When I talk about educational freedom, and when I talk about schools closing, I'm talking about when, and uh, could we pick a private school here in Cobb County? Let's just say Walker, all right? Let's just say in the next three years, all of a sudden, Walker, kids aren't getting properly educated, it's just too much, and enough parents say, you know what? And they don't have to go look at a score. They don't have to go ask the U.S. Department of Education. They don't have to do any of that nonsense. Are you talking about the parent trigger legislation? No. I'm just talking about parents. I'm talking about me, my kids. My kids go to Cherokee Christian School. Right? Our principal got rid That's of three. That's a good thing for you and them. Right. I, right. And why don't more kids have that chance? Because the government won't let us. But my, my, my principal at our school got rid of three teachers we liked this year. So we seriously sat down as a family and said, you know what? Maybe we go to another school next year, right? Because the decisions being made at that school maybe weren't in line. Then we went back and talked to the principal. Anyway, not getting too much into my personal stuff. But it was our decision. And if Walker School makes enough poor decisions to where the parents, again, without looking at all these long list of test scores and long list of information sources, you said, just say, you know what, I don't like that school anymore. It's not delivering for my child. What does Walker School do? They close. And my point is, is that's a good thing, because when a school isn't serving the very interests it's supposed to serve, which are the children, it should close. Okay, I agree with that. I wrote... Mary Kay, we've got to end this. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's yes, not what's happening. I know, I'm saying it should. <laughs> Angela, Okay, but that's terms. not what the legislation Mary Kay, is doing. <laughs> We're talking about... Appreciate your passion. We've got time for one more. 
Chip, you've mentioned an awful lot of model legislation that Alec wanted to get passed that was good for we the people. Um, but when we agree with those bills, they don't seem to pass, whereas bills that we that come down from Alec that we fight against seem to fly through before we even know what's happening to us. And you know, but mostly I'm concerned about the model legislation that promotes unelected councils who are overriding elected representation decisions. And that's not just the Charter Commission and the new opportunity school districts, but it appears that Alec also supported the creation of the Governor's Department of Community Service, which is another unelected council. So how do you explain, I mean, I guess that is limiting government because we're replacing it now with unelected well, folks. Well, here's what, the only thing I, I can answer, and again, I'm not an Asian of Alec, right? The only thing I can answer is if you have been told that Alec was behind this, no, I read it on the website. Okay, there's an out model bill. And then who was the uh, lawmaker? That is the um, criminal sentencing and prison management uh, model policy. It kind of all ties in together. Right. So there is. Right. So yeah. then the lawmaker, whoever it is, I don't know who was the sponsor of the bill. HB 310, Danny who was Porter. the sponsor? Doesn't mean it was Danny Porter. But, but in, who, he, he was running it. Who, whoever it is, doesn't matter. Joe you know, Smith, right? So Joe Smith introduces the bill, right? Just the, the process for the Georgia legislature considering that bill and, and going all the way through with it is the same whether he got the original idea from Alec or whether he got the original idea from his neighbor or whether he got the original idea from NC. It doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, he could have got that sort of that information, that idea from anywhere. It still has to go through the lawmaking process exactly the same. None of that changes, right? Well, it kind of changes a little bit when we have, yeah, I agree, our lawmakers decide which bills go through committee and which bills don't. We find we the people bills are not going through committee because they're told to stop. And I just want to address your continued statement about we need to change it at the ballot box. Yeah. We need Alec to support a model policy legislation for transparency in the election system. We don't have verifiable voting. Well, who's, we your, who's your state representative? Um, my state representative is Abdul Salam. So, you have to find somebody else. Well, I know. <laughs> but other than that, it would be Matt Ramsey. All right, so him. Matt. Matt, I think Matt, Matt's a member yeah, of we'll So we call Matt to say, Matt, you know what? Go to the next out meeting as a, as a public sector member of ALEC. You're the only one allowed to. Introduce this as a mo piece of model legislation, work it through the system, and that way the, you can take that model bill and not just affect Georgia, but you can affect 49 other states. Potentially with the exact problem same is thing that we have confidence in Alec and passing bills for the people. That's the problem. Well, I, I would completely yeah, we've lost confidence. It, I, I would ask you first. We have to look at everything that, that is there, um, and I would, it's the same exact process based on a theory that aligns typically with the people in this room. That is, are they going to get every bill right? I don't. Know, I have to look at that, but. I can tell you that to say that, well, let's just get rid of the platform where lawmakers come together to share ideas, that doesn't solve our problem. In fact, I think that hurts our problem, right? Because we, we generally want the good ideas to spread. If Alec could eliminate all the corporate interests and just be lawmakers, I think that would be a right. long way to fix it. Well, then, you got thought. And with that, it's <laughs> HB, now time. HB 310, the bill she's talking about, was Alan Powell, uh, Christian Coomer, uh, Chad Nemmer. Cherry Rogers, uh, Robert Dickey, and Jay Powell. Okay, well, let me just say this. Alan Powell, to my knowledge, has never attended an Alan meeting in his life. So I highly doubt that he took an Alan model bill to use that. Uh, who else? Christian Coomer, I've never seen. Sure, Charlie, you would know these more. Have you ever seen Christian Coomer in an Alan meeting? No. Who else? Uh, Jay Powell. Chad Nimmer. Uh, Jay Powell. Jay Powell's never been in an Alan meeting. Chad Nimmer? Yeah, Robert Dickey and, Robert and, uh, Dickey and Terry, Terry Rogers. And Terry Rogers. Unless they just started in the last two years. Well, that's, see, that's what I'm saying. You guys are a little bit behind because you don't try to follow what everybody's doing with everything. Alan Powell's I mean, been there for oh, I know, 30 forever. years. I know. And was it ever? He, I guarantee you, he, was he did Democrat. not use Alan as the model for that. Unless someone else handed it to him. And, but yeah, he's not. Yeah. He's not involved in Alan in any way, shape, or form. Would you think Alan would have pushed back against that bill? You know? But they 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 don't push. They're not allowed to push They're forward back against anything. Well, we have to draw push. to a close. <laughs> we take pride in starting on time and ending on time. And, and, and I got to eat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.